win big in 2023 for as long as it's going to continue to last with team sync from roto baller import your fantasy teams and sync your leagues get customized tools and tailored advice for your specific rosters and scoring settings including live recommendations from the live draft assistant free agent finder and lineup optimizer sync an unlimited amount of nfl mlb nba and nhl fantasy teams from all of the major fantasy platforms Get a discount for any premium pass using my promo code Knuckler. That's K N U C K L E R. Shout out to R A Dickey and R A P to Tim Wakefield. Just visit rotoballer.com slash radio. Start rotoballing like a boss. It makes a great gift for the rotoballer in your life with the holidays coming up. And what's up, everybody? Oh, wait. This podcast is also brought to you by Parlay Play Fantasy Sports. Go uh, use my referral code, Roto Brady. Use my referral link. Get those sweet, sweet deposit bonuses. Get in those player prop parlay fantasy contests. They got free contests. They got paid contests across the world of sports. It's a really fun platform. My referral code, Roto Brady. What's up, everybody? This is Brady Grove bringing you episode 116 of Roto Bowler's official MMA podcast. Tap that. We got UFC 295 this weekend. Follow me on Twitter at Roto Brady. That's where I make picks for all of the other major MMA promotions. We got um, Cage Warriors and KSW at the very least this weekend, leading up to a big UFC pay-per-view. The next week, we got Bellator, LFA, all that business. I made picks for that on Twitter at Roto Brady. Follow the podcast at Tap That MMA Podcast on Facebook, Spotify, and that's where you can find the YouTube channel. Go check out all my recent interlude episodes. I got a lot of cool ones coming up. Um, check out the episode I just put out with Mateo Top Ape Garner. That guy is awesome. Can't wait to see what that guy does moving forward in his career. And I will be in the Roto Baller MMA Discord from 4 to 5 p.m. this Saturday before UFC 295 talking DFS slash sports betting strategy for the entire card. And with me tonight, because it's a special, special pay-per-view week, we got two heavy hitting title fights. And who better to talk talk some heavy hitting fights than frequent guest co-host on the show, Connor Bone Sloan. Connor, how's it going tonight? Hey, it's going great, man. Just looking forward to this weekend. That was quite the intro. Yeah, a lot of stuff to go through. And folks, uh, all this is TBD. My wife is 38 weeks pregnant. So uh some of this could change on a dime. Who knows? But I'm gonna be on here until that happens. Uh, that would not be fun if I just went live until it happened. Uh, <laughs> so Connor, first off, a lot of big stuff happening this weekend. Last weekend, Jelton Almeida versus Derek Lewis. Connor, I have rewatched the fight three times. I can't make heads or tails of it. And the only thing I'm not accusing anybody of anything. I'm not saying that there was anything suspicious. Here's what I am saying. Jelton Almeida had no interest in finishing that fight. You can, I think that there were several opportunities that he had where Derek Lewis was ready to tap if he couldn't breathe even a little bit, and Jelton pulled up. Um, and they kept saying to Dominic Cruz, like as much as I love to hear Dominic Cruz talk, it, he has the weirdest strategic takes because he kept saying, and a lot of people have said since then, even Derek Brunson on Twitter, like. You know, Jelton was fighting a smart fight. He doesn't want to give Derek Lewis the opportunity to get up and knock him out. And it's like, what are you talking about? If that fight should have, Derek Lewis should have had one chance to knock out Jelton Almeida, and it should have been at the start of the first round. Jelton Almeida gave him five chances to get a knockout. Maybe, you know, this is me analyzing this in a microwave. What was your objective overall take from the main event last weekend? Yeah, it was an interesting one. I definitely need to go rewatch it. Um, I thought Jailton Almeida, you know, he he looked good, um, for lack of a better term. I mean, I know he got a lot of a lot of hate for not finishing Derek, um, not making an exciting fight. But I kind of have two opinions on it, um, or I kind of have uh, different opinions on it. But I don't know. I feel like maybe Almeida was trying to look for, you know, that five round experience. He's never been in a five round fight, as far as I know. Maybe he was trying to you know, push himself into deep waters, make sure he is comfortable with the fourth and fifth round. I feel like that is definitely giving him the benefit of the doubt. Um, but regardless, yeah, I, I thought there were a few times that he did the kind of look like he was pressing up off the gas pedal. So, um, you know, it was, I think Derek Lewis to give him a little bit of credit. He's, he's not the easiest guy to finish. It's definitely happened before. 
but he also has 30 pounds on Almeida. So I don't know. It was, it was an interesting one. Need to go rewatch it and kind of uh, reassess what happened um, rather than just watching it live. But I don't know. It was, it was, it was a uh, very interesting, I guess is the only word for it. Well, did, have you ever seen a ref have to warn someone to do work from full mount that many times? Yeah, that I've never seen that. I wonder if, I wonder if partially it was because, you know, Derek Lewis was a last second replacement. Mentally, he was prepared for a fighter like Blades. And, you know, he just tried to play it safe as possible because he's like, okay, look, the guy in front of me, one of the best knockout arts in the UFC, but he doesn't have a good ground game. So I just got to keep it where I'm comfortable. Don't, you know, try to um, overextend looking for a finish. Make sure that I'm just, you know, position before submission, basically to a fault, maybe is one way you could you could give Jailton the benefit of the doubt, I think. And I, I want to. And I, I do think that a lot of those things are probably a lot more realistic. Like, I, again, I'm not trying to like I don't want to go crazy because the only proof that there was is that it was an underwhelming main event. Mm-hmm. Uh, so who the hell knows? And, you know, you throw in the fact that it was a Brazilian fighter in a main event in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And there's just a bunch of information that I'll never have that yeah. like, could have transpired. Who who knows? Uh, and it was a weird terrible weekend for the bond fiends uh in that fight night as well gabriel gets finished by nicholas dalby in the co-main event ismail doesn't even get to fight because he missed weight yeah that that uh dalby versus bonfim fight was absolutely insane i i picked bonfim as a lot of people a lot of other people did but man dalby he just weathered the storm um, he came on really strong the later rounds that was a very impressive showcase from him i'm excited to see what's next for him yeah, I, I I don't know. It, it's always it's always going to be interesting when you have a bunch of Brazilian fighters fighting in Brazil. Uh, and but Ismail, it just seemed like he really missed out on a big opportunity. All you have to yeah. do, you know, show up in that situation, you get a win even against an unimpressive opponent. People are going to go crazy, and you, you know, you kind of move on. You know, like Sugar Sean O'Malley. You know, he fought a lot of guys that weren't considered impressive competition for a bit until he got his big opportunity. And it, you know, all you have to do is keep making weight and and getting those opportunities. And when you start missing weight, the the MMA fan community turns against you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you make a really good point with Sean O'Malley. Is you know, part of me is like, this sucks. You know, needs to be fighting the best competition if he wants to be a champion. But on the other hand, I'm like, I understand it. He doesn't get paid anymore. If anything, he gets paid more to fight chumps because he knocks them out and gets 50k extra. So. I mean, if 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 a young fighter came up to me and said, "What do you think I should do with my career?" I'd say, "Take the easiest fights possible until you get to a title shot." And that's exactly what Sean did. So can't really blame him for that. And you know, I I know we talked about what we were going to talk about before we started, but I just remembered a bunch of fight pay documents leaked from that lawsuit. Oh um, yeah, and. So I, I know that this is something that you try to touch on every single time you come on the podcast. What did you make of the fighter pay that was leaked for the bigger fighters like Ronda Rousey and Conor McGregor? Honestly, I don't really remember Ronda's, but I do remember looking at Conor's and thinking it was pretty underwhelming for someone who is that big of a star. Um, I think I think there's a reason he hasn't stayed very active, and it's because he makes so much more money with uh, his whiskey. So. I mean, he, you know, he got paid pretty well, but like not to the extent that I think the biggest superstar in the UFC should. Um, And also, you know, he didn't have the opportunity later in his career to make money from in-cage sponsorships, which is something I've definitely talked about before. You know, honestly, if they would just allow that, that would fix 50 percent of the problem. So. Yeah, it's hard to like give a full evaluation on until you know like the abs like every single number that goes into those pay-per-view events um because if you know if i was to play devil's advocate on a guy like conor mcgregor you'd say like you know maybe sometimes some of the payment that he didn't get is also a result of the money that he cost the ufc over a certain (laughs) the time yeah, Good point. You know, yeah. jail in new york and all that stuff and the amount of events that were canceled as a result it's hard to know how that might play into the compensation that you do receive once you actually fight on a pay-per-view card yeah i think i think just looking at it from the most basic perspective like this is how many pay-per-views uh this card sold this is how much the biggest star on the card made 
it's it's uh, kind of lopsided. They are not in favor of the fighters. So I think if simplest take is is that, but obviously there's a lot more that goes into it, especially when MMA fighters definitely tend to uh, cost the company some money sometimes. He threw a dolly at a bus. He, he probably he, he at least had to pay for the stitches for Michael Chiesa. That uh, was crazy. <laughs> um, so, folks, we got 13 fights on the slate for UFC 295. Uh, from the bottom to the top, we got a featherweight matchup between Jamal Emmers and Dennis Bajuka. A flyweight matchup. Love the flyweights combined 17 and 2 record between Joshua Van and Kevin Borjas. Borges, I'm going to go with Borges for now. 138 pound catchweight fight between Kyung Ho Gong and John Castaneda. A fly, a, feather, a, a lightweight fight between Jared Flash Gordon and Mark Madsen. Sure to end up a unanimous decision for somebody. A yeah. lightweight fight between Nazim Sidekov and Vyacheslav Borshev. A lightweight fight between Matus Rebeki. He was supposed to fight Narulo Aliyev. Instead, he's going to take on. Uh, UFC veteran and most recent tough veteran Roosevelt Roberts, uh, who I actually thought was the best lightweight on that show uh, until his underwhelming performance against Austin Hubbard. Strawweight matchup, Tabitha Ritchie and Lupita Godinez. Flyweight, Steve Ersig, who was supposed to take on Matt Schnell in what would have been a banger. Steve Ersig is now taking on Alessandro Costa. Featherweight, Pat Sabatini and Diego Lopez. Another lightweight fight. Sure to be fireworks, Matt the Steamroller Frivola against BSD Benoit St. Denis. Strawweight, Jessica Andrade against Mackenzie Dern. That's number nine and number five in the world, respectively, at Strawweight, according to Tabology.com. Then we have the UFC Interim Heavyweight Championship of the World between Sergey Pavlovich and Tom Aspinall. That was supposed to be between John Jones and Stipe Miocic. You might have heard John Jones tore a peck. It wasn't a DUI this time. It wasn't steroids. It wasn't cocaine. It was a legitimate injury. Um, and Stipe didn't, you know, want another fight. So we have, you know, a fight between the heavyweight, like the, the best heavyweights in the world of the future uh, and the guys that were on their way up in this division being stalled by, you know, some of the older guys that were taking a really long time to fight. And now, main event, the light heavyweight championship of the world in his return, Jiri Prochaska, or as Chael Sonnen would say, Jiri Prochiri, against <laughs> Alex Pereira. Um, so, Connor, real quick before we get into the card, because we were also supposed to see Derek Brunson versus Roman Delize on this card. Derek Brunson is now debuting in PFL soon at middleweight against Ray Cooper. Um, do you think that you would rather see Jones versus Stipe or do you think you'd rather see Pavlovich versus Aspinall? Because the more I think about it, it's actually kind of hard to tell because I really, I, I think that if we were talking about Jones Stipe, I was going to be depressed tonight because we were going to be talking about a very fast exit for Stipe Miocic. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm totally in agreement. Um, I, the only way that I would have rather seen Jones versus Stipe is if Stipe was able to get an impressive win. Um, obviously, you know, we don't know how it would have played out, but if that was the case, I would say, give me that fight all day over any fight in the world. I just want to see John Jones lose. Uh, maybe I'm just a hater, but you know, it, I would love to see Stipe at 40, what is he? 41 beat the greatest of all time in the UFC. That would just be, that would just be amazing. Um, but I mean, looking at it from, from just on paper, I guess, I don't know if it's, if it's on paper or. Um, or not, but Sergey Pavlovich and Tom Aspinall is, is such a fun fight. I mean, they're both absolute killers. So I think I think it's both good and bad. So let's start with the main event. We got the UFC light heavyweight championship of the world. Jerry Prochaska. Last time he fought was June of 2022. Connor, when he got injured, we heard it was the worst shoulder injury of all time that any human being had ever sustained. Slightly yeah. over a year later, he's back in the octagon. Uh, yeah, I mean, the only one I can think of that may have been worse would have been uh, Johnny Walker doing the worm. Sorry. <laughs> and, you know, Jerry, it was after that crazy classic fight against Glover Teixeira. There's a revenge element here, the beautiful friendship between Alex Pereira and Glover Teixeira. Jerry has three wins in the UFC, one per year over the last three years against Volkan, 
Dominic Reyes, and Glover Teixeira. Alex Pereira has had a very interesting time too. You know, he knocks out Sean Strickland, who's now the UFC middleweight champion, becomes the UFC middleweight champion and knocking out Israel Adesanya, gets finished then a little, like in six months, against Israel Adesanya, uh, April of this year, second round knockout, at light heavyweight, gets a split decision win over Jan Blockowitz. Connor, I thought that I was going to like Alex Pereira at minus 122 because of the layoff for Jiri. But the more I think about this, I don't know how much I care about the layoff. I think Jiri is a better mixed martial artist. Um, I think that Alex Pereira has relied on some really close results against guys where I don't think it's going to play out the same. I think if in a mix, in a kickboxing match, Alex Pereira gives Jiri the work. In a mixed martial arts fight, I think that Alex Pereira is going to be hurt at certain times. Um, I, I think that, like, I have no idea how this fight is going to end, but I do think that I like Jiri plus 102 because I at least think this is a 50-50 fight. And otherwise, I think I have to favor the guy that has a more impressive resume at light heavyweight in MMA, which is Jiri. So if I'm going 55 out of 100 for anybody, I'm going Prochaska. What do you think about the main event? Yeah, I think I think I mostly agree with with your take here. I think there are a few things to kind of factor in. Um, I think part of it's going to be how much does how much does Yuri, you know, go to his uh, grappling at all? I think he's shown in the past he's a competent grappler. Um, he reversed Glover a few times late in the round, was able to get top position, land some bombs. Against um, obviously, overall in that fight, he was out grappled, but that was against one of the best grapplers and also Alex Pereira's uh, close training partner. But if you look at Yuri's uh, work before the UFC, he definitely has shown that he's at the very least a competent grappler. Um, I think if he goes for some takedowns and some takedowns in smart situations, times them well, gets on top, lands some, some ground and pound. I think that would be a really smart thing. I think if he just tries to stand and bang with Alex Pereira, it's going to be a rough night. But I also think that, you know, they kind of share some of the same issues. They're they're both really active strikers. They're both really good strikers. But um, Alex Pereira has been knocked out before. Izzy knocked him out, obviously. Uh, pro, pro, Jiri has been hurt before. Glover hurt him pretty badly. So I think I think Jiri is probably going to come in with a better game plan than Alex Pereira. But it's it's a tough call. It's a toss up. I, I'd like to take Jerry too, since he's a slight underdog. But man, it's it's gonna be a fun matchup. That's uh, I think that's the most important thing. And this is one I don't want to think too hard about because I do think that this is about a 50-50 fight. If Pereira was the underdog, I would go with him, and I'd probably go with him by knockout. Um, but I do think that like, you know, this is like a bit like how I viewed Jan versus Izzy, except for the fact that like. Yuri is a much younger dude, much more dynamic at this age. Um, he's not as, you know, smart of a game planner as Jan. Izzy's not as small as Alex Pereira, but ultimately, like, I, I think that at light heavyweight, I think Yuri is just going to give Alex Pereira a little bit too much to handle. I think that each of them are going to have their moments. And I think if For you sure. bet on this fight, you're going to be sweating at, at either point, no matter who you bet on. Yeah, I think another thing to consider is is Yuri is significantly bigger than anyone Pereira's fought at 185 and significantly longer. Um, you know, I think they're both going to have success on the feet. Um, but I think Yuri is is probably just going to catch him cleaner earlier, and that'll be a, a key difference there. But it's it's a tough what's a tough one to call, man. And and talk about a tough one to call. The co-main event for the interim UFC heavyweight championship of the world. Sergey Pavlovich is the minus 108 underdog, Connor. Tom Aspinall, the minus 112 favorite. Uh, I'm seeing even Sergey at some plus money somewhere, but overall, this is an incredibly closely handicapped fight. Sergey Pavlovich was knocked out in round one in his UFC debut back in November of 2018. He was born in 1992, has an 84-inch reach. He's a, he's a big human being with no neck. Uh, so that can be hard to knock someone out who doesn't have a neck. And he was knocked out by Alistair Overeem in his debut. Since then, six straight first-round knockouts against Marcelo Gohm, Maurice Green, Shamila Burakimov, Derek Lewis tied to Ivasa, and the kicker here, Curtis Blades, which which is way different than getting a first-round knockout even against Derek Lewis and tied to Ivasa. 
Tom Aspinall returned in July of this year after, you know, getting injured July of last year against Curtis Blades. Um, so we have no idea how that fight was going to end up playing out, but that's his only loss. It, it, and it's hard to really call it a loss in the UFC. Wins in the first round, everyone uh, against everyone except for Andre Arvlowski, who he subbed in the second round. But he's beaten Jake Collier, Alan Bedell, Arvlowski, Sergey Spivak by first round knockout, Alexander Volkov by straight arm bar, and most recently by first round knockout, Marcin Chibira. That was in his return after that devastating injury. I have absolutely no idea what's going to happen in this one. The real thing is, do I think like Tom Aspinall is going to be able to take down Sergey Spe- uh, Sergey Pavlovich and get a, you know an early submission like he was able to do against Volkov? Absolutely not. I don't know why because I like we haven't seen necessarily that situation for Pavlovich. You know, like if this fight might not go past round one, I think all the props are going to have it under two and a half pretty significantly. Uh, Mm -hmm. And by the way, like like I'm not even betting like a method of victory in uh, the main event. If I did have to pick one, I guess it'd be Pereira by TKO knockout plus 110. Uh, But Pavlovich, you know, by knockout is plus 120. Aspinall inside the distance Minus 105, and it's barely different than his odds to win the fight straight up. Under two and a half rounds, Connor, is minus 530. If I, <laughs> it, it doesn't make any sense. Sergey Pavlovich, I think Tom Aspinall probably would have finished Curtis Blades. We don't know. I think Tom Aspinall is the better overall mixed martial artist. And I think coming back against a guy like Marcin Chibera and getting an early finish is big news for Tom Aspinall. This is kind of another fight, though, where it's like this is about a 50 50 fight. And Sergey Pavlovich is a really big dude. These guys are so evenly matched in terms of their talent, the level of competition they've beaten. And we just haven't had to see Sergey Pavlovich do anything but knock someone out in the first round. If I have to go with somebody, uh, I think I'm going Pavlovich because I think this fight is going to be ended on the feet. And I think Pavlovich is actually in the better position to do that. What do you think about the main event or the co-main event? I, I definitely agree with your take. Um, I I might be leaning a little bit more heavily Sergey, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, I think I don't think Aspinall is going to be able to have the success he needs to have on the ground. And a big reason for that, you know, you talked about Pavlovich's only loss to Alistair Overeem. Um, that knockout was, you know, due to ground and pound. I'm sure everybody everybody listening has watched it. But just in case you need a reminder, it was a ground and pound TKO. It was very brutal. But, you know, that was a while ago. And I think that probably, you know, that loss is is probably really good for Pavlovich in the long run. I bet he – the, the crazy thing is we don't really know. So I'm kind of just going out of the limb here. But I think his uh, takedown defense has probably improved significantly since that point. Um, I think if Aspinall is able to get him down, he won't be able to hold him down. And I think just on the feet, Sergey is just going to be too precise and too accurate with his punches. Um, don't get me wrong. Aspinall is also amazing on the feet, and he has amazing hand speed. But it's not really, you know, I think it was it was Conor McGregor that said, what was it? He said, it's not speed and power, it's timing and precision. Sergey, whenever he's throwing in combos, he's just so accurate. It's insane. So uh, I'm staying with Pavlovich, probably Pavlovich by TKO. But, you know, this this one's another close one. It's a very good fight. It Yeah, that, that's the great thing about, like, these two top fights is, like, they really are 50-50 and not in a bad way. Like, anything could happen in the main event and the co-main event. And... Now we get to Jessica Andrade versus Mackenzie Dern. Mackenzie Dern, the minus 198 favorite, Jessica Andrade, the plus 164 underdog. Connor, it's crazy because Jessica Andrade has fought four times in 2023. She was on a three-fight winning streak (laughs) between September of 2021 and January of 2023 against Cynthia Cavillo, Amanda Lamos, and Lauren Murphy. Against Lauren Murphy, she landed 231 strikes. She's on a three-fight losing streak. She got finished by Aaron Blanchfield. Yan Nan and Tatiana Suarez. It, not at the start of this year. If you had told me that you had a bet on Jessica Andrade to be a UFC champion in some way by the end of the year, it wouldn't have been crazy. And now it's absurd. 
it, it's happened so quick for Jessica Andrade. Um, and now Mackenzie Dern, winner of two of her last three, a split decision over Tisha Torres, where she did get outstruck 76 to 50. And then last time out, a unanimous decision against Angela Hill, who she outstruck 126 to 66, took down three times and got a knockdown against someone on this podcast. Give you Angela Hill the last time out, and she was a money line winner. You're welcome for that one. A loss in between to Yan Jianan, who just does that to people, who won with a majority decision. 113 to 61 on the striking, even though Mackenzie Dern landed two takedowns. Mackenzie Dern then threatened with some very serious submission attempts uh, in that Yan Jianan fight. A loss to Marina Rodriguez, October of 2021. Mackenzie Dern is someone who has often felt forced on me, almost <laughs> like, a, like, I don't know, kind of Sage Northcutt. Like, not the same promotional level, but like very often they would put her in these situations where I felt like I was being led to believe that she was a lot better than I thought she was at the time. But now I think that I have overcome that feeling on Mackenzie Dern. And I've more like been burned on Jessica Andrade the last three times out where I was like, why is Jessica Andrade getting faded so hard in these three fights? And she got, you know, she got beaten bad uh, and, and it's looked worse every time out. So I think that Mackenzie Dern, actually wins this fight right now with the momentum she has and the momentum that Jessica Andrade does not have 65 to 70 times out of a hundred. I don't hate minus 198. And I think that Dern by submission plus 120 is probably the best prop of that fight. What do you think about this one? Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, I feel like recently when I'm picking Andrade, she's been letting me down. So I'd say your take is probably the safest, but you know, part of me, like my, uh, my heart tells me Andrade by KO just because her KOs are so violent and so cool that like, I always want to see it. So hopefully that's the case. Uh, what's the uh, line on her by KO? Andrade. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see here. Andrade by knockout plus four fifty. <laughs> Shit. I'm taking that all day. All right. I know what <laughs> I'm doing. Connor, you bet with your heart on Derek Lewis <laughs> and it burns you this past weekend. I didn't actually bet on him. I just said that he was going to win, thankfully. Well, I guess I did when I made my picks, but luckily I didn't throw 100 bucks on him like I thought I should. So, <laughs> good point. Well, next up, this fight is just made to be a fight of the night candidate at the very least. Matt Frivola against Benoit St. Denis. St. Denis getting a lot of hype lately, a lot of love. BSD's minus 230, Frivola the plus 190 underdog. Connor, I start to salivate every time Frivola is an underdog of, without even taking a further look at it. And then mm -hmm. you, you do start to look at it. Frivola on a three-fight winning streak. He's only fought once this year, but three straight first-round knockouts against Gennaro Valdez, Oatman Azatar, and most impressively, Drew Dober, May of this year. Um, two losses before that to Armin Sarukian and T-Rex Terrence McKinney. Benoit St. Denis continues to look better and better. The last two wins that he's had have been ridiculous. And mm -hmm. now it does seem like Benoit St. Denis does deserve to be talked about in this echelon. He lost his UFC debut to Elizu Zaleski Dos Santos, who, as we know, and as we saw this past weekend, is just a guy that no matter who you are and how talented you are is going to give you fits on any mm -hmm. given night if you're not one of the top three fighters in the world. Benoit St. Denis last two wins, a first round rear naked choke over Ismail Bonfim and a second round knockout against Tiago Moises, who he outstruck 101 to 24 and <laughs> yeah, five crazy. times to one. If Frivola, it, because the Drew Dober fight was going to be like a barn burner, but, like, Benoit Saint-Denis, I think, has a variety of ways that he can finish Matt Frivola. Um, and I think that this is actually closer to, like, the... Uh, yeah, because Benoit Saint-Denis can win this fight in a lot more ways than even the younger opponents that Frivola's fought in the last few years. I mean, even the Jalen Turner fight, that now happened April of 2019. So I, I think it's a little bit closer to the Terrence McKinney fight, I guess, for Frivola. Uh, compared to his last three fights, I think like Saint Denis inside the distance. Um, that's minus one fifty. That's my favorite bet of this fight. I think Saint Denis wins this fight like seventy seventy five times out of a hundred. I am never willing to count Matt Frivola out, but I would have liked to see him at like 
in the plus 225 range if I was going to take a chance on as an underdog. What do you think about the steamroller versus BSD? This is an amazing fight. And I want to point out that when the uh, line first got released, it was like, Frivola was like plus 330. Damn. And I was like, I'm hammering that all, all day, all day, every day. Um, but now that it's tightened up a little bit, you know, I think it's a, obviously a little bit tougher call. Um, I want to say I have met Matt Frivola in person. He was an awesome guy. So it's hard for me to ever bet against him because he was just, he was really cool. Got a picture of them. He was happy to have a fan. It was awesome. Um, but Benoit St. Denis is, is a killer. He's, I think, I think he's got some size on Frivola. Um, I might be wrong about that. They're both pretty big guys. Uh, but I, I do think you're right. Benoit St. Denis probably has more ways to win. Um, and if we, if we look at back at his, his only loss, that was at 170. And if you actually go watch that fight, it was insane. The beating that Benoit St. Denis took, like, I remember people were like insanely mad that the, the, uh, ref wasn't stopping it. So, I mean, at the very late, at the very least, I think it shows that Benoit St. Denis is, is tough and he's not going to be able to get put out easily. And I think Favola's best chance of winning is, is by KO. So I'm taking Benoit St. Denis, but I definitely will not be upset if Matt Favola wins. And you got some good pictures too with like, uh, didn't you take a picture with Felicia Spencer one and Christoph Jaco, who had the largest hand I've ever seen in a picture? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that was awesome. They were all really nice too. It was it was cool. It's always <laughs> nice to meet somebody that can, you know, rip your head off that's that's also nice to you. Can you imagine like walking around like a Lakers game and like just like Michael Jordan's getting a hot dog? <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't make any sense. I'd be like, what the hell? <laughs> uh next up, we got a fight between Pat Sabatini, the minus 120 favorite, and Diego Lopez, the plus one hundred underdog. Um, Diego Lopez, winner of his last fight against Gavin Tucker, uh, who I believe is a common opponent. Nope, that's Tucker Lutz. Um, his last win was against Gavin Tucker. It was really early in the fight, in the first round, a, a triangle arm bar, one of the best submissions in all of the game. He did start off his UFC career, including the Contender Series, with two straight unanimous decision losses, where he was taken down to combine seven times. Um, he got a uh, hundred and thirty two strikes landed against him. Now, granted, for Diego Lopez, that was against Yoan Anderson Brito and Mozar Evlev. However, Pat Sabatini, born November 9th, 1990. Oh my god, happy birthday to Pat Sabatini! Look at that. Oh, no. um, <laughs> winner of five of his last six fights against a solid slew of competition that included Jamal Emmers, Tucker Lutz, TJ Laramie. And Lucas Almeida, with his only loss being Damon Jackson, September of 2022. Uh, three wins by decision, two by submission. Now, Pat Sabatini, too, has landed a combined uh, 13 takedowns in his last three wins. I think that, like, Diego Lopez, all the credit to you in beating Gavin Tucker early in the fight August of this year. All the credit to, like, you had to face two really tough fighters coming into the UFC. Um, however, I think that you have to give a lot of credit to Pat Sabatini being five uh, five out of six, with that loss being to Damon Jackson, who was on a great run of his own at the time. So I think that Pat Sabatini, I'd be very comfortable betting him minus 120. I think he wins this fight 60 to 65 times out of 100. If I had to pick a prop for this fight, I would go Sabatini actually by decision plus 275, and then I'd probably go Sabatini by submission, plus 250. What say you about Lopez versus Pat Sabatini? This is definitely an interesting matchup. Um, I think I might have to disagree with you for maybe the first time tonight. Um, I'm taking Diego Lopez all day. I think um, he's better on the ground. I think they're both very good on the ground. They're both very good submission artists, but um, I think Diego Lopez is hot right now. You know, he's riding a very, very nice win, even if it may have not been the best competition. But I'll put it this way. I think uh, most most of our Eve, Lev, I don't know if I said that right, but I think Eve Lev is um, a significantly better fighter than Pat Sabatini. And Lopez had an inc incredibly close fight with him on short notice. So that might be me using some MMA math, which is notoriously uh, unreliable. But I'm, I'm taking Lopez here. And next up. We got a flyweight matchup, and I God, I wish this was Steve Ursek versus Matchnell. Every fight that Matchnell is in is a banger. 
Uh, yeah. I would love to see Matt Schnell versus Manel Kopp. And unfortunately, Manel Kopp and Matthias Nikolaou are running it back when I think there's so many more interesting options for Starboy. However, flyweight Steve Ursig versus Alessandro Costa. Ursig, the minus 192 favorite, Costa, the plus 160 underdog. Steve Ursig coming off a debut win against David Dvorak by unanimous decision, outstriking him 54 to 53, three takedowns to one. Um, Alessandro Costa, 13 and three as a professional, 27 years old. He has two fights in the UFC, a loss to Amir Albazi in the third round back in December of 2022, and a round two ground and pound victory over Jimmy Flick. Jimmy Flick, um, who I always like, think I, I'm less impressed by than he, like, he's only got two losses in the UFC, so maybe. It's oh, it's it's not Jimmy Flick. It's JP Buys that I should always be hard on. Mm -hmm. uh, I often confuse those two, but you know, kind of a weird resume for Alessandro Costa. Um, Steve Ursig, I do think, does have the far better win of the two uh, in the UFC ranks. Amir Albazi, I think the jury's still out on this guy. You know, like even though he hasn't lost in a long time. Uh, I thought he lost that fight to Kai Kara France. Oh, he absolutely did. There's no doubt about that. And I, dude, you, you give me Amir Albazi versus Tim Elliott, which was supposed to happen June of 2022, and that is Amir Albazi's first loss in the UFC. I'd put everything I have on it. Yeah, I, yeah, I think Steve Urseg is going to get a win here. Um, what was the what was the line again? Uh, Urseg minus 192, Costa plus 160. I think Urseg wins this fight. 75 times out of 100, minus 192. I definitely don't hate it. I would go Ursig by decision here. Um, let's see. That is, uh, do they not have that yet? Because this like had to get thrown together a little quick. Yeah, they don't have the decision prop yet. Oh, wait. Nope, they only have it for Costa. That's weird. I, I would... might uh, I might throw a curveball here and go Ursig by submission. Really? What makes you think it? That's that's the most he has on his record for wins. Um, six by submission. Um, I don't know. I'm just feeling feeling the submission. I'm gonna go with my gut. Well, that's fair enough for sure. And we got Lupe Godinez next against Tabitha Ritchie. Lupe, the minus one eighty favorite. Tabitha Ritchie, the plus one fifty underdog. And by the way, like I am very excited to see to see Steve Ursig. It's just like and not to be like you know again because of the resume Alessandra Costa has. It's going to be a good fight. I just do wish it was happening against uh, Matt Schnell. Mm -hmm. and I agree. So then at strawweight, Richie versus Lupe Godinez. Lupe has won five out of six against Lumaluk Boonme, Ariana Carnalosi, Cynthia Cavillo, Emily Ducote, and Elise Reed. All by decision, except for last time out against Elise Reed, September of this year. She won her with a rear naked choke. She's gotten three wins in 2023. Her last loss was August of 2022 against one Angela Hill, who can do that to you. Uh, she got she outstruck her 92 to 85, but Angela Hill just really good at getting that round by round close decision. Uh, but you do have to question the level of competition that Lupe Godinez has beaten up to this level, and the fact that you know she's got losses on her record to Luana Carolina as well. Uh, and it, it can be, you know, that it's hard to look underwhelming against Luana Carolina, I, I think, uh, who, you know, does her best to like make close decisions, but also just hasn't left me impressed through a, a, a lot of her UFC career. Tabitha Ritchie, on the other hand, four wins in a row since her debut loss in the UFC June of 2021 to Manon Furio. So uh, already like, it's kind of like a good omen almost when you debut in the UFC and get beaten by someone who's already really impressive, like Manon Furio. Rattled off four wins in a row, three decisions, one submission against Maria Oliveira, Pollyanna Viana, where she landed 10 combined takedowns in those fights. Jessica Panay, March of this year, four takedowns in that fight, outstruck her 36 to six, got the second round arm bar. And then June of this year, Unanimous decision over Jillian Robertson. I think actually the best win between the two of these fighters, uh, that or Pollyanna Viana, still with Tabitha Ritchie, where she landed 100 strikes, three takedowns to Jillian Robertson, 76 and one takedown. Tabitha Ritchie is the underdog here. Connor, am I? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm surprised. 
I'm surprised by that too. I was about to say how is she the underdog? I, I definitely like her in this fight. Plus 150. Dude, give me that <laughs> all day. And I, I know I, who my captain's gonna be. Dude, like Tabitha Ritchie, there I, I just can't point to a reason that I think that she would lose to Loopy, especially with the last win being against Elise Reed. You know, like in, in Dakota, that's a name that like it it feels like you when you beat Emily Dakota, it feels like it means a little bit more. She is always in like some high volume striking fights, but at the end of the day, her only win since July of 2022 is against Ashley Yoder. Um, and so I just don't think that Loopy's wins mean a whole lot as compared to Tabitha Ritchie's. Tabitha Ritchie plus 150, hammer it. And Tabitha Ritchie by decision plus 200. Give me that all day. I think Tabitha Ritchie wins this fight 65 to 70 times out of 100. Wrong yeah. favorite in this. Yeah, I think the only other option to consider would be Richie by KO, but probably decision would be a, a smarter one and still you double your money. So I like that bet too. Now we move on to a late replacement fight. This is Matus Rebecca versus Roosevelt Roberts. Uh, Rebecca, the minus seven hundred favorite no oh my lord roosevelt roberts the plus 500 underdog uh again matisse rebecca was supposed to fight supposed to fight Nerolo aliyev the uh the tajik eagle currently ranked number 52 in the world by topology among uh world lightweight fighters now let's let's start off with matisse rebecca three wins in a row Two finishes against Rodrigo Ledio in the Contender Series. All right. Nick Fiore by unanimous decision, who he outstruck 89 to 34, three takedowns to one. And then Lewoik Rodzabot Rodzaboff, June of this year, second round knockout. He had two knockdowns in that fight. Pretty impressive. Roosevelt Roberts, the predator, who will have a seven inch reach advantage, two years younger. Now, like this is a guy, this is actually one of the guys on that like veteran season of the ultimate fighter that probably deserved to get cut when he did. Um, one of the few, but like at the end of the day, I still think Roosevelt Roberts is an extremely dangerous fighter. Like he did get pieced up by Ignacio Bahamondes. He had the no contest with Kevin Kroom, the loss by first round submission to Jim Miller, which is very understandable. Really the problem with Roosevelt Roberts is that his wins in the UFC when he was there weren't impressive. And on the ultimate fighter, he had the opportunity to prove a lot of us right that he was the best lightweight on the on the show that season. And yet it was, again, the team format of the ultimate fighter where him and Austin Hubbard were just super hesitant against each other. And even at the end of the day, Connor, I don't know if you remember, I thought Roosevelt Roberts won that fight against Austin Hubbard, but it was Austin Hubbard that got the chance to fight Kurt Hollibaugh in the finale. Um it seems like it's a mistake to have Roosevelt Roberts as such a heavy underdog, but like, you know, mostly all he's done is beat unimpressive opponents in the UFC and lose a lot of fights when it mattered the most. And Matus Rebecca has rattled off three in a row, granted against not that impressive competition. I think that like you go, I don't know, Rebecca. Oh God. Inside the distance is actually minus 188. That's actually not horrible. Yeah, I agree. And and looking at uh, Rebecca's record, so fun fact, he has two wins in a row by uh, elbows from Crucifix. And one of them is against Magomed Magomedov. So that's an impressive win right there. It's It was it was in 2020, so it's been a while ago. But um, as much as I like Roosevelt Roberts, um, as, as much as I do think he is a solid fighter, I, I think Rebecca has has more tools and is going to get uh, going to get a, a win here. I don't think it necessarily will, will be easy, but I like him inside the distance. And yeah, looking back at the the Ultimate Fighter season, that was an insanely close fight with Hubbard. I thought he won too, but I um I kind of like Roosevelt Roberts, so I might have been biased. But well, I'm interested. He is a huge underdog. Like, I mean, you might as well, might as well throw ten bucks on him. You know, it's <laughs> you'd make fifty bucks. I it it's just like you know Roosevelt is a guy that I think suckers our hearts into it. I don't know why 
I like him so much, but I do. Uh, and that is kind of the value of going on the Ultimate Fighter when a lot of people don't want to do that anymore and would just like to prefer to be on the Contender Series. But yeah, yeah, I think Matus Rebecki probably wins this fight like 85 times out of 100. Um, so I'm not betting a straight up victor here. And But I do think that at the money you're getting Rebecki inside the distance at minus 188, I'd be comfortable betting that straight up or at least using it to string a parlay together. Yeah, what would be really cool is if you could bet on uh, stoppage by elbows from Crucifix specifically. I, I would do it. I wish you could. Third There's got to be some sort of like <laughs> Saudi book that you can do that for. Uh, <laughs> and are you cool to talk about two more? Yep, let's do it. Nazim Sidekov against Vyashlev Borshev at lightweight Borshev. Um, I accidentally scrolled down way too far. Borshev, the plus 102 underdog. Sidekov, the minus 122 favorite. Sidekov, winner of three in a row. Two third round knockouts against Ahmad Hassanzada in the contender series August of 2022. And then against Evan Elder, February of this year, he was getting outstruck by Elder and even got knocked down by Elder, but then ultimately finished the fight in the third. Then July of this year, he gets a second round rear naked choke against Terrence T-Rex McKinney. Uh, only 14 strikes have been landed up to that point in the second round. Two takedowns landed by Terrence McKinney in that time. Vyacheslav Borshev, ultimately three and two in the UFC, but he is one of his last three. Uh, wins over Chris Duncan in the Contender Series by second round TKO. Dakota Bush, first round TKO. Um, then he loses two straight unanimous decisions to Mark Dakais and Mike Davis, two guys that I completely understand if you lose unanimous decisions to because he got taken down a combined 20 times, Connor, 20 times in those two fights. And then bounces back real nice against Mahashate May of this year with a second round TKO. Um, I kind of expected Borshev to be a slightly bigger underdog. Like if he wasn't the favorite, I expected him to be like one, like plus 125, which yeah. in a lot of variation, ultimately I do kind of think that this is like a 50, 50 fight. Like, I don't think that we're going to see Nazim take, you know, Vyacheslav Borshev down nine times like Mike Davis or Mark Diakis did. Um, <laughs> You're butchering his name, man. It's Mark Jacasey, right? <laughs> Jacasey. Yeah, I think that's it. I'd, I'd be pretty stupid if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty it, sure. It probably, I mean, I'm sure it is. Jacasey. You know, I've heard that like said a lot, but like, you know, that's a hard name to pronounce. That's a lot of yeah, eyes. It's I can't to, blame you. Hard to determine what to do with all those eyes. But ultimately, like, I don't see a whole lot of reason to not like Vyacheslav Borshev as the underdog here. Plus 102. I'm even seeing him at plus 110 some places. I think that even if you think Nazim wins this fight 55 times out of 100, I still think that this is a close enough to fight to where I'm going with whoever the underdog is. So like Borshev plus 102, plus 110, I love it. Um, I don't know if I'm comfortable with a method of victory here, though. Uh, maybe like if you are, I mean, if you're betting like Nazim, he's only finished people inside the distance. And yet, Vyacheslav has not lost inside the distance um, in his time in the UFC across five fights. So, again, I just don't know if I love a method of victory prop here. What do you think about this one? You know, I think I'm feeling the Zim uh, inside the distance. I feel like uh, Borshev has just not impressed me in the past. Um, I think Nazim is good enough on the ground to have some success there and just well-rounded enough to to finish him somehow. It, like he did land, Vyacheslav did land three takedown or three knockdowns against Mahashate. Um, and like Mahashate, I guess, is a guy I gave a little bit more credit. I mean, he does have a win against Steve Garcia, he does have two losses in a row, but to Rafa Garcia and Vyacheslav Borshev, I, I this is a weirdly like so many fights on this card are very well deserved to be closely handicapped, and this is no exception. Yeah, I definitely think it's a, it's a close matchup. And speaking of a close matchup, Connor, Jared Flash Gordon against Mark the Olympian Madsen. Uh, Jared Gordon is the minus 198 favorite. Mark Madsen, the plus 164 underdog. Here's the thing. Jared Gordon, he beat Patty Pimblett. 
Yep. He beat him. He lost it on the judges' scorecards, but he was the better fighter that night. I think that's the important part to value moving forward. If Jared Gordon was fighting Jake Paul coming up this Saturday, I, I would probably think he loses a decision because it's more important to give the the more you know famous fighters the victory in that situation. I don't even know what I'm saying about that. <laughs> it's just weird that Jared Gordon you know outperformed Patty Pimblett to that level and loses a unanimous decision. What a coincidence! Against Bobby Green. He was losing that first round, but like Jared Gordon is a guy that is really tough to wither over the course of three rounds. We don't necessarily know how that fight would have ended. Jared Gordon is a very well-rounded fighter. This is a guy that can land anywhere from 50 to 100 strikes against you and take you down anywhere from one to seven times, depending on the fighter that you are. That is not going to happen against Mark Madsen. He's not going to take him down a bunch of times, but the goal for Jared Gordon is to use his well-roundedness and the strikes that he can land um, to keep Mark Madsen at bay. I don't know how the hell Mark Madsen landed 98 strikes against Clay Guida. That's because Clay Guida has fought approximately 80 times in the UFC, uh, <laughs> dating to August of 2021. Mark Madsen really has beaten like an impressive slew of opponents, honestly, like Austin Hubbard, Clay Guida, Ving Pachel, for being so old in the game, uh, in you know, being born in that George Orwell year. That's pretty impressive. But then he did lose his last time out to Grant Dawson. I think in this situation, you just favor the more well-rounded fighter uh, in Jared Gordon. I think that his the the striking volume that he's able to throw at you and, and the well-roundedness and the takedown defense that I think he will have, I, I think he'll get taken down a couple of times, but not enough for Mark Madsen to get the victory. Give me Jared Gordon to win this fight probably 60 to 65 times out of 100 and give me Jared Gordon to win it by decision plus 110. What do you think about this extremely close matchup? Yeah, this is a this is a tough matchup. Um, I I may lead Madsen a little bit here. Um, I, I just think Jared Gordon hasn't impressed me much lately. But at the same time, looking at Madsen's age of thirty nine, you know he may be kind of on the decline just athletically. So you may be right. I don't know. I, I like maybe Madsen by decision. Um, or I mean, if you're gonna bet on a on a method of victory for either guy, I'd say go by decision. I think they're um they're both close enough in terms of uh skill that it's gonna be hard for one to put the other out. And this fight going to decision is minus two fifty. So I, I do think that is worth it too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Are you gonna hop off or do you want to talk about the last three? I'll let you wrap it up. Uh, I don't know too much about the last three. I don't want to say something dumb. <laughs> gotcha. Connor Bone Sloan, everybody. Thank, uh, thanks for him to be in here. We got UFC 295 this weekend. Connor, looking forward to talking about these fights as they're happening with you. Have yourself a great weekend. Absolutely. Thanks, Brady. All right, folks. We got three fights left. We got a bantamweight matchup between John Castaneda and Kyung Ho Gong. Kyung Ho Gong. Is the plus 114 underdog Castaneda the minus 135 favorite? Let's start with Kyung Ho Gong. Crazily, winner of five of his last six. And you won't believe it, the only loss is to Ronnie Yaya. November of 2021, he's on a two-fight winning streak where he landed 100 strikes en route to a unanimous decision against Dana bat Jarrell. June of 2022, and he gets a first-round rear naked choke against Christian Quinones, June of 2023. Um, the other wins came against Taruto Ishihara, Brandon Davis, and Pyongwen Lu. Um, several split decisions, too. Two split decisions in a row in that stretch. He lost a split decision to Ricardo Ramos, August of 2018. He won a split decision all the way back in 2014 at UFC Fight Night Hunt versus Nelson. Um, this is a guy that ends up in close fights. And by the way, he's born 1987. He seems older than that. His nickname is Mr. Perfect. That's pretty awesome. John Castaneda, born in 1991, winner of three of his last four, with the loss being a second-round knockout to Daniel Santos, October of 2022. He bounced back his last fight. He got outstruck 61-40 to by Muin Gafarov. He did take him down three times and got a knockdown en route to that unanimous decision victory. Also wins over Eddie Wyland and Miles Johns in that stretch of time, dating back to February of 2021. His only other loss in the UFC is to Nathaniel Wood, which I can forgive. Nathaniel Wood landed 131 strikes in that fight. 
to take a breath. You know, if Kyung Ha Gong was like a plus 175 underdog, I'd be riding him all day. But he's not. And I don't know. I mean, Kyung Ha Gong did have a pretty good fight there against Dana Bajarao. How he lost that fight to Ronnie Yaya in November of 2021, it's kind of hard to believe. Castaneda, Castaneda, there's only law, I mean, like, you know, you really had to outstrike this dude. It, this is a very close fight. I, this is a hard one to bet. I think that, like, Castaneda probably wins this fight, like, 60 times out of 100. I, I think that minus 135 is a decent value. I don't hate Yang plus 114 either. Uh, it's a weird spot to be in. Now, I don't know how Castaneda gets it done is the thing. I think that he has a variety of ways to get it done. If I am picking a method of victory prop, I'm actually going gong by decision plus 235. But I think the best bet of this fight is Castaneda minus 135. Next up, we got a flyweight matchup between Joshua Van and Kevin Borjas. Joshua Van. 8-1, and one, the fearless, 22 years old, fighting out of Myanmar, and he's uh, living in Texas now. That's got to be a culture change. Seven of his professional wins are inside the distance, five by knockout. He came to us by Fury FC, where he uh, was the flyweight champion in December of 2022. He won by split decision over Zalgisu Magalov in his UFC debut, June of 2023. Zalgisu Magalov a guy that fought a lot of tough prospects and tough competition, but ultimately came up short against a lot of those fighters. Kevin Borjas, 25 years old, coming to us from Peru, ranked 79 in the world, according to Tapology and the flyweight ranks. Eight of his career nine professional wins are by knockout. Now, he only has one uh, win at the UFC level. In the Contender Series against Victor Diaz, August of this year. And statistically, uh, come on. Borjas, a Galo Negro. He landed 87 strikes in that fight. He did get taken down five times. Joshua Van landed 120 strikes against August Umagalov. He did have 103 landed against him. What are the odds on this again? Van's the minus 225 favorite. Yeah, yeah, I do think that, like, I think this fight goes the distance. Um, I think that there will be, like, 200-plus strikes landed in this fight one way or another. And I think Joshua Van, by decision, plus 260, probably the best prop of the fight. Borjas, by decision, plus 380. Ultimately, I do think Van wins this fight, like, 70 times out of 100. I, I think that having a UFC win against a guy like Zolgas who has arguably gotten robbed a couple of times, fought a lot of tough fighters. I think that that is more impressive than the contender series victory for Kevin Borjas. Um, and I love, you know, the, the professional record of uh, Joshua Van before he came to the UFC. And lastly, a featherweight matchup between his, between Dennis Bajuka and Jamal Emmers. Jamal Emmers. The minus 285 favorite, Bajuka, the plus 230 underdog. Let's start with Bajuka. One and two in the UFC. And that is two contender series fights, by the way. All three fights have been unanimous decisions. He lost his contender series debut to Melzik Bogdasarian. He got outstruck 102 to 57. He did land two takedowns. Then he wins against Kalaya Romero. Um, and that was in July of 2022. Outlands in 49 to 39, one takedown each and a knockdown for Bajuka. Then a, a tough matchup against Sean Woodson, August of 2023, loses a unanimous decision, outstruck 71 to 42, taken down four times. Jamal Emmers is eight years older. Uh, he will have a four-inch reach advantage. His nickname is Pretty Boy. That always helps. Kind of tougher to judge this guy's pedigree, considering he fought Julian Arosa on the Contender Series back in June of 2018. Uh, four of his five UFC fights past the Contender Series level have all gone to the judges' scorecards. The one that didn't 
was a submission loss to Pat Sabatini, August of 2021. Two of those fights were split decisions. He came out on the wrong side of both those split decisions. One against Giga Chikadze, March of 2020. He outstruck him 54 to 38 and got two takedowns. Giga still got the split decision victory. He lands 103 strikes and five takedowns against Vince Cachero. Um, a unanimous decision victory February of this year against Hussein Askabov. And then he gets a split decision loss to Jack Jenkins in a very close fight, 57 to 59 for Jenkins on the striking, one takedown each. Why should I be impressed by Dennis Pajuka? The odds on this make plenty of sense. I think Emmers well deserves to be the minus 285 favorite. Um, and I, I think that the only thing to go with here, it, these guys have only been going to the judges' scorecards, whether it's 100 strikes landed, five takedowns landed, um, and the best fighter between all the, it's even impressive that Jamal Emmers went to the judges scorecards with Jack Jenkins, uh, who has, you know, two fights ending inside the distance in his time in the UFC. He did get knocked out his last time at Chepe Mariscal. I, I, I just think that like, there's no reason, even with two wins for Jamal Emmers out of six UFC fights, what he's done in that time is, you know, arguably beaten Giga Chikadze and Jack Jenkins, two very close decisions. Um, and he's, you know, done very statistically well in the fight since then. Even though he's the older of the two, I think that Jamal Emmers, with his reach advantage, I think that he's going to be able to land the majority of the strikes, uh, keep Bajuka at a distance. Bajuka, I don't think he's going to outland Jamal Emmers, and I think that that is by far his best hope. I don't think he's going to be able to get close enough to take Jamal Emmers down. Jamal Emmers wins this fight 75 to 80 times out of 100. I'm not touching a straight-up victory in this fight. Give me Emmers by decision, plus 102. That is the best prop of the fight. And folks, that is it for UFC 295. This has been episode 116 of Roto Bowler's official MMA podcast. Tap that. You can follow me on Twitter at Roto Brady. That's why I make picks for all of the major MMA promotions. Bellator, PFL1. Ryzen, LFA, Cage Warriors, Cage Fury, major boxing events on Twitter at Roto Brady. Follow the podcast, like, subscribe, leave favorable comments and reviews at Tap That MMA Podcast. That's on Facebook, Spotify, and the YouTube channel. This Saturday, the card starts at 6 p.m. I will be in the Roto Baller MMA Discord from 4 to 5 p.m. doing the weekly DFS slash sports betting Q&A. Come there. Let's talk strategy for UFC 295. Thanks to Connor Bone Sloan for coming on the show. Check out my interlude episodes from this past week. I got exciting ones coming up. I got the one with Mateo, top ape Garner from this past week. Uh, my wife is 38 weeks pregnant. Who knows what the next few weeks will be as far as being able to be on here. But thanks for listening tonight. Have yourselves a great weekend. Enjoy this pay-per-view fight with two championship fights. Peace.